But what we have here today is we have Ms. Janice Gates and Mr. Conrad Washington. And Conrad is our VA uh, Assistant Director for the FACE Initiative up in Washington, D.C. And uh, Charles, back here from Virginia, had an opportunity to represent me uh, and, and meet Mr. Conrad. And so we struck up a good friendship and I said, uh, you know, Chaplain's allergic to work, so I decided to pawn my work on someone else, and he was more than grateful to come down here and conduct a very important. And Janet also works for the VA, and she's she's the suicide prevention uh, coordinator uh, for this area. So for those of you that are in this area, we're going to give you a whole bunch of information uh, to begin with. So what I'd like to do is just read the bio on Conrad, introduce him, and get this party started, okay? All right. Conrad Washington serves as the Deputy Director with the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiative within the Office of Public Intergovernmental Affairs. In this capacity, he provides collaborative strategic leadership to develop and cult uh, cultivate partnerships with faith-based faith, nonprofit and community organizations. These partnerships assist to increase awareness of VA programs and services to veterans, their family, survivor, caregivers, and other beneficiaries. Mr. Washington uh, is in the process of studying, learning, being, doing, everything that we in this group should be doing as well. We never stop learning. The day that you stop learning is the day you're dead. And I don't see any dead people in here right now. So bottom line is continue to study, make yourself better, and understand. So at this time, I would like to introduce our special guest, Deputy Director, Mr. Conrad Washington. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. They gave me a microphone, but I think it's okay, right? And then I think I have to stay in this little spot with bottles and even like a too, so I'm hanging in there, right? So uh, thank you for the introduction, like I appreciate it. So I'm from Washington, D.C., right? And I represent the VA Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiative, right? What does all that mean? It's a lot of words, isn't it? A lot of titles, right? Yeah, yeah. The well, titles come and go, right? Right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and share with you what uh, the Center of Faith is all about. I'm not going to prolong the time. Uh, here are some of the topics we're going to cover, and I'll pause. If you have questions, uh, please stop and I'll answer them. So what our mission is, basically I'm not going to read it for you, but we reach out to all types of uh, organizations that are faith-based, nonprofit, and community. And the purpose of reaching out uh, to those organizations, just like the chaplains here, uh, is to create a relationship, partnership, so that we can touch the lives of veterans and their families. And I'm going to tell you how we do that through events, uh, through breakout sessions, and then we invite local suicide prevention coordinators who are trained clinicians to come and uh, share with us about uh, some of the suicide uh, uh, things of the veterans. All right, so the office began in 2004 under President Bush administration, right? People always ask, well, Conrad, how many of you guys have been around? I've never heard of you, right? Well, uh, there's a season for everything, right? And so this is the season that we're getting uh, publicity, uh, visibility, whatever you want to call it. And in this season, I want to make sure that I do justice and amplify what our mission is, right? So we begin in 2004. Last year, May of 2019, the president signed another order instituting or re-implementing us uh, as the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiative. So we've been around for a little while. Still good? We're going to get to this stuff here. So we're not the only show in town. What does that mean? In Washington, D.C., there are 13 federal agencies or centers within the, uh, the government, right? So we're not the only show. We're one of them. It's on the USDA. You see the list there. I'm not going to read them. And we all collaborate, partner. We do different things. We meet very often on various subjects. Uh, and I share a story with you. I was in Los Angeles last year, uh, partnering with the Salvation Army and uh, Bell Shelter, shelter there. Uh, uh, his name is... Uh, Richard, uh, Mr. Little, he runs that, uh, that, uh, that program at Bell Shelter in Los Angeles. And uh, as we were having our presentation and we got done, he took me through a tour of the facility and they house about 500 or so veterans. So as we're walking through, well, I didn't have a rope toe in, right? <laughs> so we were walking through, he took me through a garden they had. And I was like, okay, he said, hey, Conrad, I got a question for you. He said, you know, we're looking for some funding for our garden. Can you help us out? Now, obviously, I'm I don't know what I did tell you. I'm from Chicago, so I really don't know a lot about farming. Uh, right? uh, and my office doesn't have any rents. But what I did do, because of the relationship and partnership I have with some of these faith-based directors and other federal agencies, I partnered with USDA, Mike Beattie, and start connecting the dots and said, hey, 
let's see what they have, see if we can get some, some funding to fund their, their garden. Because the veterans there created the garden, and then they wanted to have the vegetables sold to the local economy, mm -hmm. right? And so that's a, that's a process. So those are some of the things we do. We connect people with people who can help them, right? So here are some of our recent partners uh, that I had in the last probably three, three or four months. I've been working hard trying to connect everyone because uh, I have this philosophy, maybe a little crazy, uh, that we can go out to the city. I'm sorry. Yeah, we can go out. We can go out to the city and have an event with a with an organization and leave the city better than we got it. And so my partnership with Google, for example, when I was in uh, in Nashville, they came out. They didn't offer positions, but what they did offer was. Uh, they have a veteran program. They talked about that veteran program, gave literature for it, handouts, so we can educate the veterans and their families about some of the opportunities they have in the, in the area, right? And I can go on and on. I'll stand in front of the slide there. I can go on and on about some of the other ones. K-Love, that's a radio station, right? We did a PSA with them. The Warriors Journey, they've heard about them. They have programs program within their organization. Workforce Solutions, Greater Dallas area. Last November, uh, we had, uh, we had the, the first November kind of a, escapade uh, around the country celebrating veterans and their families for the entire month of November. So I was going the entire month. I had about nine events. Uh, I was very tired when I came home, right? Uh, but part of that event, part of the stop was on, in November, we went to Dallas. And I partnered with the City of Dallas, Workforce Solutions, and Red White and View in Dallas to offer 14,000 positions, uh, 2,100 contingent offers, and 20 on-the-spot hires. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we want to do when we reach out and partner with organizations. Not just giving lip service, but having something that's tangible, right? Okay, and I talked about the uh, K Love radio station, the Warriors Journey. Uh, those are some of the people that were there. That's uh, uh, Mr. Lewis, Salvation Army there. Kind of see, I really do go out to these places. It's probably sitting out. It's on the road, right? it's a good time. So, according to the executive order the president signed, right, uh, what that does is, I better say, it's only getting in the way here. Uh, what that does is, these are the areas that we focus on. So the, v, the, the Department of Veterans Affairs have a lot of programs, and it's probably too many for me to, to, to kind of uh, go into detail here, but I'll share with you, we have a, a uh, Veteran Justice Outreach Program. By show of hands, how many are you familiar with that? Do we try? It's a great program. Uh, we have uh, 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 cities throughout the nation that give an alternative way for veterans to go through the court system uh, and get them rehabilitated back into the system, uh, the system of uh, society, rather than just hammering it. Right? Uh, it's a successful program, and uh, Jen will talk a little bit more about it. Uh, so we're focusing on all these different areas, religious liberty, uh, substance abuse, uh, different things, crime prevention. Uh, these are all the things that we're focusing on in this executive order. So here's a statistic you can kind of see. What would, what would be religious affiliation, we talk about veterans. So the largest population of veterans in the nation, Protestant and Catholic, kind of give you a snapshot of, uh, of what we look like from religious. And these are self-reported, right? I used 2016, I think 2017 just came out, but it's pretty similar. Uh, so kind of get a feel of that. Good. And so with the religious data, the number of veterans that we had throughout the nation uh, per capita, you can see is Alaska and Maine, right? But then if you pop up a little bit, you can see California, Texas, and Florida. Those are the top three states that have the most veterans. So we do focus on those states, and we try to partner with, well, with different organizations so we can go out uh, and take the city and, uh, and bring the 22 million veterans under the VA umbrella, because they're all not under our umbrella yet, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the whole purpose of this. Questions and comments? <laughs> you good? You guys still awake? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. There you go. That's <laughs> So what are our objectives? Uh, I'm not going to read the bullets, but I'll share with you. We want to make sure that when we partner with organizations that it's tangible, that they're nonprofit, and that they have a veteran program uh, with more than one veteran. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't want to talk about it anymore, but I'll share with you. I was out uh, at the White House delegation uh, in, uh, in December of last year, went to Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the current events in Puerto Rico, but uh, this kind of stemmed from that a little bit. Uh, I was sitting at the table with uh, Salvation of Army, uh, a lovely organization, but that particular uh, part of the Salvation Army in Puerto Rico, we sat down with other faith-based directors, and I said, well, hey, how many veterans do you have uh, that you support uh, in your programs? And they said, well, we'll get back with you, Conrad. Mm. I'm a retired Marine, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and I'm, All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. We'll pray for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I failed to, failed to share with you. Part of, part of the journey I had was uh, serving in the Marine Corps. 
<laughs> Serving in the Marine Corps for 20 years, and I went to Iraq in 2004, with 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, and 29 Palms. I was a Marine Corps drill instructor uh, from 90 to 2001. Uh, so kind of a crazy career, and then God called me to ministry and, and doing some things here. Uh, Thank, but, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are you better? <laughs> okay. So I say that because when I go out and talk to people, I want them to know that uh, when we talk about veterans and the things that they go through, I can relate. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sensitive to uh, the things that veterans experience because I experience some of those same things. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I mention that. It's not a who I had one deployment. As you know, many service members, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard had many, many more deployments mm -hmm. than I had. Uh, but I, I, I do understand uh, the process of, of getting worked up and going out and uh, doing what we're trained to do, right? Uh, so with that being said, when we go out to these organizations, I want to make sure that they have what they have. And so that organization in Puerto Rico, they emailed me back and said we had two veterans. You know? <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's painful. So for me to come out with all the resources that the uh, department has, I just can't, I just can't justify that. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, as chaplains, when you go out and you see a need for uh, uh, or calling to help veterans, Please make sure that we have a substantial amount of money so we can go out and take the city. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so what does that look like? When we have events and we partner with different organizations, the event goes usually from 9.30 in the morning or 8.30. We'll have a 30-minute plenary. That means we'll have people come. We'll have a keynote speaker, either the secretary or senior secretary from, uh, from the headquarters. And then we'll go into our uh, uh, breakout sessions. And they range from uh, suicide prevention, uh, like Jen is going to do here today, which is about an hour long. Uh, and then uh, and then we have uh, benefits, we have homelessness, uh, we have every type of uh, uh, breakout session you can imagine so they're educated and that they're engaged, and then we can make sure that they understand what they bring, right? And that's the whole purpose of it. So what are some of the accomplishments we have? People always want to know, what do you really do, right? <laughs> Uh, so yes, this position, this job, our office is relational, uh, as you may already know. Uh, but take a look at the slides here, the bullets I'm not going to read, but this is what we do. We go out and we want to basically, there are about over 350,000 uh, uh, nonprofit organizations in the United States. That's a lot. Uh, and I can tell you, I don't have all of them under the umbrella of the VA, right? Uh, and all of them may not have veteran programs. But the intent is to go out and reach as many veterans as we can through these organizations. Right, so when you go back to chapters to your various geographical locations, not just DAV, but if you know of nonprofit organizations that have better programs and doing good things, please let me know. And you say, well, Connie, how do we let you know? Well, I have cars. I don't have a whole lot, but I have a few. You take pictures of the car. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, government cutting back, right? I leave them here. <laughs> and then uh, you can take a picture of the car. Uh, you can reach out to me, and I have my coordinator touch base with you. We can plan something and get something going. Okay, so that being said, I'm going to wind up a little bit, but I want to share with you a couple of thoughts. So, how many heard of the Mission Act? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Mission Act came out June, is it 4th or 6th? 6th. June 6th, I'll get, get it mixed up. And so, I know there's a lot of controversy around the, the Mission Act and what it does and how helpful it is. Uh, but I want you to know, I'm going to read a few things for you so you can be aware. But also, uh, before I read what the Mission Act uh, can do, uh, by show of hands, how many of you connect to your local uh, VA medical center? We do. Thank you for sharing. That's important because that VA medical center has a lot of resources that can help you in doing what you do, right? And what we're doing is touching the lives of veterans and their families, right? So I told uh, Mike earlier, we had a great conversation. You know, I, I'm in D.C., you know, I'm wearing a suit and a tie, right? Uh, you know, and, and I'm going to all these meetings and I'm listening and I'm, I'm, I'm I'm using discernment, and I'm saying to myself, if it doesn't help the veteran and their family, Congress is not going to support it, mm -hmm. plain and simple, right? And I can tell you that the Secretary Wilkie is a man of faith. He supports the Center for Faith, uh, and that's good to know. Uh, but as I go to navigate, uh, if it doesn't support the veteran, no matter what uh, you know, uh, branch they're from, I'm just not going to support it. I'm going to step back, right? And the other piece I'll share with you, as I go out and I partner with different uh, organizations from uh, nonprofit and faith-based, that means pastors and clergy from all over the nation. I will share with you that uh, it's from an ecumenical standpoint. That means, as Mike was mentioning you all about, uh, your, your responsibilities as chaplains, uh, it's sort of the same with me. Uh, I'm not concerned with doctrinal differences, right, or theological differences, mm -hmm. right? Yes, I'm in seminary, I grew up in the church, I'm a PK, I got it. Right, went to Capitol, <laughs> high school in Chicago, I got it. But that's not why I'm here. 
if we want to have a conversation about faith and where, you know, Jesus and our life, that's a separate conversation. Right now, what I share with some of those organizations and pastors and clergy, because they're Muslim and different Catholic as well, I share with them that within your faith, there should be love. Mm -hmm. right? And if you say that you're strong in your faith, then I, want, I would like to see you extend that love as we go out and reach the veterans in your congregation. Mm -hmm. That's what I use. Right? And so an example of that is I was in Oklahoma last year, uh, and uh, we went there, and uh, you know the, uh, the Native American uh, culture has a, a different type of uh, uh, remedy for sicknesses. Two right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's okay. And, uh, and so he was sharing with me how they deal with some of the sicknesses in their congregation. Now, uh, I, I don't agree with it, absolutely, and the hair on my neck was standing up, you know. Uh, <laughs> right? But what I, what I told him was, it's just what I told you guys. I said, the VA is about faith. This office is about faith. So we want to share the love of the VA by finding out how many veterans <laughs> are in your congregation of Native American that have used our services and are better off because of it. And he told me he had like 1,300 or so, because they were like a bunch of uh, different, uh, I forget what they called. So I, I want to capitalize on that and say, guess what? There's a purpose for the VA. They can make your life better, you know? And think about it. This is how it translates to money. If I went to a city, just like right now, as I was walking this morning, uh, late this afternoon, rather, coming down the hall, and I saw the out breakout sessions for the, uh, uh, the benefits. Let's say 50 veterans in Orlando got awarded X amount of dollars. You guys tracking with me? Mm -hmm. What does that do? Mm -hmm. That makes the VA look good because that means we have more we have more veterans under our umbrella mm -hmm. in Orlando. But guess what else it does? Those veterans' life have been improved by a monetary mm -hmm. amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. So they're improved. And oh, by the way, they're probably going to spend that money at Disneyland, Disney World, something in the economy, right? Mm -hmm. So the economy is going to improve. So it, it, it does us justice when we go out and try to capture the veterans and help them get what they rate, what they deserve, what they earn, right? All right. Off the soapbox. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read a few things about the Mission Act that's important. Uh, the Mission Act says here that veterans have more choices for care and better customer service uh, when they choose to receive community care, right? Uh, veterans have expanded access to community care, right? Scheduling appointments is easier. Uh, payments to community providers are uh, made in a timely manner. Is that what some mm -hmm. issues are, uh, right? I know. Yes, I'm going to hit your questions in a minute. Uh, veterans have access to a new convenient option to receive care for minor injury and illnesses. Now, before I take your questions, I'll share with you, it's not a disclaimer, I'm not wiggling out, but I'll share with you that I'm not a clinician, right? And I have a, a little knowledge of the, of the mission act, but I will share with you that I can connect you with the local VA medical center and the point of contact that can come and brief you on what the mission act is all about in your area, right? That's what I can do. Now, so before I read Janice's bio, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, I don't want to. I don't really want to differ with you, but unless I'm mistaken, the Department of Veterans Affairs, in relation to the Mission Act, has a gag order on it with Region Four. Hmm. So I'm not familiar with that, and mm -hmm. I wasn't briefed on that when it came out. But uh, I'll take that. There's a note in the region, yeah. and I will research that. Well, I'm not familiar with uh, any kind of gag order for Region 4. Would you repeat that? Right. Yeah, so the question was, uh, he heard there's a gag order in the VA for Region 4 uh, regarding the Mission Act. Uh, so I'm not familiar with that at all. Uh, but I, 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 can, I can find out. I can, get, I can let Mike know. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, yeah. Anything else? No other questions? I'll say something positive. The Mission Act works. Oh, really? Tell us why it works. Because I've had two referrals. I got to do physical therapy at Robert Wood Johnson in, in Somerville because they couldn't get me in. And then as a female, I got to go get um, my annual exterior of the VA because they couldn't get me in 30 days. Wow. And so for me, it works in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple of other things before I take my seat and read her bio, I keep saying that. Uh, when I go out and talk to some of the pastors throughout the nation, uh, I can tell you that uh, we always have what's called uh, the suicide prevention training that you're going to get today. Uh, I get clergy in the room because I think it's important for all clergy, all denominations to understand uh, the path that veterans go to and the, the, the thought process when they think about contemplating taking their life. And so uh, this is not just exclusive to chaplains. Uh, it's for veterans, it's for clergy leaders throughout the nation, and I go all over. Uh, I didn't mention, but our office, as you probably can imagine, a 
but because we're instituted by the White House, we have a dotted line to the White House, the White House Office of Public Liaison. And so I just had a meeting with them. We're working hand in hand. There's an executive order that came out March 5th. It was signed by the president uh, this year, sitting that a task force uh, will be implemented, mm -hmm. right? And they have a year for that task force to come back to the president and say, this is what we're going to do. And so he, uh, he's uh, uh, aligned a, uh, a, professor, a professional doctor. Her name is Dr. Uh, Barbara Van, Van Dahlen, D-A-H-L-E-N, I hope I pronounced it right, Van Dahlen. Uh, her and I met two or three times in the last few days. Uh, she's working with the White House and me. Uh, she's a uh, uh, psychologist, but she's leading this task force. And the task force is all inclusive. What does that mean? It's not just a VA task force. They're, they're encompassing various uh, federal agencies to join them, HUD, USDA, so that we can go out and come up with a plan on how we can eliminate or, minimum, or decrease 20, 22 veterans per day taking their life. Mm -hmm. That's what that task force is about. It's not just lip service, but it's like, hey, what are we going to do? And she is a, a woman of faith, right, as a clinician. Right? And she's partnered with the Center of Faith here in the VA. She's a bit better of uh, the employee. She believes in faith. And so uh, we're going to work together to reach as many pastors and clergy as we can throughout the nation. And I can tell you, you uh, probably, uh, uh, you may hear, but I hope you do, uh, what's going to happen is I'm in the process right now planning uh, uh, a big uh, symposium or summit. It's going to be a suicide prevention summit in uh, Maryland, right? The city of Maryland with uh, Reed Temple. You know Reed Temple? Yes. yes. Is that the DOD slash VA conference? No, but I'll, I'll be there as well presenting <laughs> in, that, in Nashville. The, uh, uh, but we're working with Reed Temple. We're going to bring some pastors all over the nation uh, to come to Reed Temple. We're going to take the city and educate uh, the clergy leaders about suicide uh, prevention, right? So just be aware of that. So with that being said, let me read. One more quick question. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Are you planning to have the round table again at, at midwinter 2020? That was an excellent day that we spent yes, in Washington, D.C. in 2020. Mm -hmm. That's how I learned all of this stuff that, yeah, yeah. I, that I did not know. Yeah, so thank you for, for saying it, because I almost forget about the round table. <laughs> so every year we have a round table, right? And the round table, all it is is just clergy coming from all over the nation, from all ecumenical uh, standpoints, and we brief them on the benefits and resources that the VA had. And thank you for coming, we appreciate it. I am going to have it, but I'm going to do it slightly different. I'm going to incorporate the round table but I'm also going to have a summit in, in conjunction with that. So I haven't determined if I'm going to have it at the VA because I think it's going to be larger. Uh, the White House is going to be part of that. Uh, and then what I want to do is I want to make sure that uh, we hit uh, as many of the large congregations as we can. Uh, I grew up in a small, my stepdad was a pastor of a small uh, Baptist church in the west side of Chicago. Right? Uh, so I don't exclude small churches. Uh, but I think the most bang for your buck is when you reach those larger organizations because you have a larger uh, amount of veterans. Right? session we're going to do. So yes, we will have it next year. Okay. It will be February, okay. uh, but it's going to look different than it did this year. Okay. Right. I, if I could make one suggestion, Absolutely. that it, it was on the same day that we had our visits on Capitol yeah. Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that yeah. cut yeah. into uh, some of our time. Yeah, yeah. All right. First of all, um, the uh, the roundtable discussion, uh, Conrad reached out to me through Charles's contact because Charles was running around to me. It had nothing to do with the DAV. As a matter of fact, when Conrad so graciously uh, gave us an opportunity and a date and a time, I sent that information up to National to let them, or at National to let them know that we had something else that is another opportunity for the chaplains to come and do it. So it wasn't part of the DAV program, and so this was the first year that we did it because uh, <coughs> Deputy Director Conrad Washington was gracious enough to accommodate us, and it just so happened to be during the midwinter. Now, if it's a date outside the midwinter and you're not coming to midwinter, then you're on your own dime, of course. But if you're coming to midwinter to talk to your congressman, that is priority of the DAV's mission. And if you've got enough uh, folks from your department or chapter to go talk to the congressman and you need to slip away and, and Conrad then in turn uh, gives us another opportunity, it worked out really well this year. And I'm not going to guarantee it's going to work out the years in the future. It just depends on... It's a, it's a separate entity, and it just so happens that he accommodated us. And I'm very thankful that you uh, got a lot of good information from that. And for those of you, uh, and Charles, you went too, right? Yeah. But we so, miss you, though, Chaplain. We uh, know you had an emergency. It, well, and I appreciate that, yeah. sir. Thank you. My wife's doing well. She's out there swimming, and I'm in here under the hot light <laughs> swing. I don't know who got the better deal there. So we'll take a look at the dates next year. When I coordinate with, uh, with, with the chaplain here, uh, we will make sure that uh, we, we hopefully have the time where we can get more uh, max participation. Right? Any other questions for me? 
about the VA Center for Faith and why we exist and what we do? Okay, so right now, by show of hands, who understands what we do? We do, right? We do, right? <coughs> Basically, just remember this. We partner with uh, nonprofit faith-based organizations around the, around the country, right? And, 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 and it doesn't matter what denomination they are. You know, part of my uh, study last year uh, in, in uh, seminary was to go out and talk to a, uh, a, uh, a mosque, right? Go to a mosque, visit a mosque, and talk to uh, the Amman there. And so uh, I've never been to a mosque in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I served in the Marine Corps for 20 years. I had Muslim friends, but that's as far as it went. You know, we had conversations and just hang out, but I never really, you know, dove into, you know, where they worshiped and prayed. Uh, so it was a new experience. I was a little apprehensive. So I pray, and I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> but it ended up being very well because the gentleman who I talked to, at the end of our uh, two hours or three hours when we talked, we absolutely didn't agree, which means it was obvious uh, uh, based on our uh, different uh, theological uh, doctrines. Uh, but I invited him to the round table, and he came. I gave him a hug because I believe I'm a hugger, right? <laughs> and uh, it probably doesn't work well with him. Oh, man. <laughs> But I'm the hugger, I'm the hugger. Yeah, I'm the hugger, and uh, he came, and uh, you know, and, and we showed some love for him. He's gonna come back again, hopefully, so uh, that's what we're about. So I'm not gonna probably let me get Jen up here. Let's so read her bio. There's no other questions. Mike, you had something? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna try to read this without messing it up. If I did, forgive me. Janet Gates is the coordinator for the suicide prevention team for Orlando VA Medical Center originally from South Carolina. Ms. Gates cool. earned a master's degree in social work from the University of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. She maintained a private practice in adolescent and adult psychotherapy prior to joining WJP, joined mm -hmm. VAMC in Columbia, South Carolina. That's a medical center. <laughs> As an outpatient mental uh, health therapist in 2011, Ms. Gates uh, then accepted the community therapy trainer, is trained in cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure, eye movement and desensitization reprocessing and motivational interviewing. She's also a national trainer for first responders understanding our veterans' mental health and suicide prevention, training VA clinicians, VA police officers and community first responders in the needs of veterans in crisis, understanding post-deployment issues and suicide prevention. I needed to do the record years ago. When I was <coughs> Ms. Gates is currently serving as a suicide prevention coordinator at the Orlando uh, VA Medical Center, overseeing a team of 10 staff who provide services, uh, an average of 190 veterans per month, while uh, responds to approximately 180 calls in, to the veteran crisis line monthly, uh, and provides monthly outreach events to each of the six counties in the Orlando Medical Center catchment area. Ms. Gates is dedicated to raising the level of awareness of the risk of suicide and the available resources to those in need. Ms. Janet. Thank you so much. That makes me sound way more important than I am. Um, my name is Janet Gates, as Conrad just said, and he's going to thank you for pulling that up for me. I appreciate it. Um, I have the opportunity to talk to you today about a SAVE program. You know, the federal government, we have acronyms for everything. So the SAVE program is all about suicide prevention. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with each of you today because all of you are working with our veterans and they're all struggling with various things because they're human beings. So the things that I'm talking to you today, even though the presentation is focused on veterans, suicide prevention is a public health issue. Mm -hmm. Everybody could be struggling with this. So your friends, your family mm -hmm. members, your children, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your neighbor next door, your coworkers, anybody could be struggling with suicidal thoughts. So please keep that in mind today as I'm talking to you, even though I'm focused on veterans. This is applicable for everybody, okay? So, thank you so much. So a little bit of housekeeping. I know that the topic of suicide can be a sensitive issue, sensitive topic for some. If you need to get up and leave, we're all adults. Folks need to go down the hall, get water, use the bathroom, mm -hmm. take a phone call, do whatever you need to do. Absolutely. If you'll give me a little thumbs up, that lets me know that everything is okay. If you're not okay and this is just a little too much and you need to get up and leave, that's okay too. But if you give me a thumbs down as you're leaving, then I'll know to follow up with you afterwards, okay? And I can meet with you somewhere else later, okay? All right. Thank you so much. <coughs> so what we're going to do today is I'm going to um, go over the objectives. We're talking about suicide prevention. I'm going to give you a, a few facts um, related to suicide. I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of statistics. I'm going to give you a few numbers, but not a whole lot. And we're going to talk about some of the myths and some of the realities of suicide. 
prevention. And then we go through the steps of SAVE, S-A-V-E, tell you what those are, and then I'm going to give you some resources at the end. Okay? Any questions so far? Yes? No ACE cards? No ACE cards. I have some veteran crisis line cards before you're done, though. I will give you those. Okay. So talking about suicide, um, when, it, when it comes to suicide, these are going to be these first few <coughs> these are statistics for the United States. This is not specific for veterans on this slide, okay? So we've got more than 45,000 lives lost to suicide. <coughs> That's a lot. Think about that number for a minute. 45,000 are dying by suicide every year. Okay. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. We don't hear about it much in the news unless it's been a celebrity or you know some other um, famous person going on because there's this stigma related to it. And part of what I do is walking around, talking to folks just like you today, I want to help reduce that stigma so that we can talk about it. Okay. And then finally, for this slide, someone's dying by suicide every 12 minutes. Now I'm a social worker, math is not my thing. But think about how long we're gonna be sitting in this room. How many 12 minutes have gone by? How many lives were lost? just in the time that we've been sitting here today. Yeah. It's an important topic. It's one that I'm really passionate about and I want to make sure that I get the information to you so that you can share it and you can use the information when you're interacting with other people. Mm -hmm. okay. So thinking about suicide, um, even though I said 45,000 are dying by suicide, over a million people are attempting suicide. Again, really big <clears throat> every 35 seconds, somebody is, is making an attempt by, by various means, and we'll talk about the means in a minute. Women attempt suicide three times more likely than men, but men are four times more likely to die by suicide. What do you think that is? Firearms. Lethal means, yeah. Men typically use firearms. Women typically overdose. That is not a hard and fast rule. There are exceptions to all of it. But for the most part, when firearms are used, that's the most lethal means of suicide. So think about the population with which we interact. If you think about the veterans, when you're thinking about military, break it down to gender. Do we have typically more men or more women? Okay. What are they going to typically be using? Firearms. Now, the women are trained in the military too, so what are they going to be comfortable with? So let's not take it for granted. Okay, oh, it's a female, so she's going to overdose. Not necessarily. Okay? I'm not trying to upset anybody. Or I'm not trying to, it's not a shock value. This is reality, and I want, I want you to understand why this is so important. So that we talk about it today, okay? Thanks. So, there we go, thank you. Okay, so now these statistics are gonna be specific to the veterans, all right? So 18% of all deaths by suicide in the U.S. were by veterans, okay? The latest numbers are 20 veterans a day are dying by suicide. 14 of those are not connected with VA care. Now, again, math is not my thing, but if you think about 20 veterans a day dying by suicide, today's August the 4th, mm -hmm. that means 4,300 veterans have died this year by suicide as of today. 4,300. Any number greater than zero is too many. Mm -hmm. We have to do something. Now when you think about that 20 a day, 14 are not connected with VA care. We need to reach those 14 and we need to bring them into the VA and we need to get them engaged in treatment because treatment works. So as you're interacting with the veterans, it's great to get them connected with the benefit side of the house. They have earned those, absolutely. They are entitled to those and they need those benefits. They're also entitled to treatment and treatment works. So if you're talking with a veteran and they're not seeking care at the VA, talk to them about that. Please encourage them to come and get care. The only way we can help them is if they come to us. 
So I really appreciate the opportunity such as this to get out and talk to folks who can help bring the veterans into care. As Conrad was so kind to read my bio, one of the things that I'm really passionate about right now and helping to get that, that 20 down and reaching those 14 is I'm working with our national training team to reach out to first responders in the community. Our VA police, they are awesome individuals, absolutely. But if, if our VA police are interacting with the veteran, they're already at the VA, okay? So we're working with the community law enforcement, the community first responders, firefighters, EMTs, so that when the veteran is struggling with something, the first responders are there, whether the veteran was involved in a domestic dispute or had a car accident or an overdose. Folks who are responding to them can talk to them about bringing them to the VA and getting them connected with care so that we can reduce this number. Okay. Veterans are more likely to die using a firearm. We talked about that, folks in the military, they're used to, to using a firearm. On average, 764 suicide attempts per month by veterans. And 25% of veterans who died by suicide had a previous suicide attempt. So if somebody that you're talking with is telling you or has shared with you that they have attempted in the past, that's going to put them at, at greater risk automatically. So I'm going to address a few of the myths and, and um, some of the realities so that we can help reduce this stigma. So I'm going to ask you to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, okay? If somebody really wants to die by suicide, they will find a way to do it. If you think that statement is true, I want you to give a thumbs up. If you think that statement is false, I want you to give me a thumbs down. Oh, we got a good mix here. Okay, we got a good mix of folks. All right. So let me tell you that that is a myth. Okay. If somebody really wants to die by suicide, they will find a way to do it. You know what? If somebody really wants to die by suicide, there's generally a sign. They're generally changing behavior. They're talking about it. They're looking for ways to die. There are some clues that we need to be able to pick up on. Mm -hmm. okay? no myth. They may not have shared it with you. They may have shared it with somebody else. Or they may be sharing it with you that they're not sharing with somebody else. By being there and listening and supporting them, you're giving them an opportunity to talk to you about it. You're, it's going to give you the opportunity to ask them about it. And I'm going to get to the asking part. Don't, I'm not jumping ahead of myself. But there are generally some signs, so that's why we're doing this training, and I'm going to talk to you about what those signs are so you can keep an eye out as you're interacting with different folks. Okay? Asking about suicide may lead someone to take his or her life. If I ask them about it, whoa, that's going to give them the idea. Thumbs up if you think that's true. Thumbs down if you think that's false. I see a lot of thumbs down. Fantastic, I'm so glad. All right, asking about having suicidal thoughts is not gonna plant the idea in somebody's head. Okay, it's not like, oh gosh, should have had a V8. Oh, why didn't I do that before? Okay, so if you're asking somebody about it, it's not gonna cause them to have suicidal thoughts any more than if I'm asking somebody if they're having chest pains that they you know, suddenly develop angina because I asked the question. What it does do is it puts out the welcome mat and provides an opportunity for them to talk to you about it. There are talkers and there are doers. If you think that's true, give me a thumbs up. If you think that's false, give me a thumbs down. There are talkers and there are doers. I see a lot of like either in between or not asking, not answering at all. Okay, I see some thumbs up, I see some thumbs down. Okay, this one's, this one's kind of a tough one, right? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to tell you it's a myth. Okay, mm -hmm. there are talkers and there are doers, and that's not necessarily mm -hmm. true. All right, like I said before, when somebody's thinking about suicide, something's changing. They may be talking to you about it. Their behavior may be changing. They may be talking mm -hmm. to somebody else. I've heard folks just um, in the various places where I've worked, the <coughs> that I've worked with, oh, they're just talking about it. Oh, they're just trying to get attention. Mm -hmm. Oh, they just need something. Mm -hmm. You know what? If somebody is making a statement about mm -hmm. taking their life to get attention, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? Whether they're thinking about suicide or not, they're struggling with something and we need to we need to figure out what that is. Okay? Anytime somebody is making a statement of nobody will care if I'm gone, you know, nobody will miss me, things are never gonna get any better. If they're making those statements, those 
are serious statements, and we need to take them seriously. Okay? And we need to confront them head on. If they're just trying to get attention, again, that's a pretty serious way to do it. They're struggling with something. Let's figure out what that is. If it is suicidal thoughts that they're struggling with, let's get them connected with a mental health professional who can help them get out. He or she won't die by suicide because, and we've got a list of reasons why they won't. They won't do it because they've got a vacation planned or they've got kids that love them. They promised me they wouldn't. Okay? I see some thumbs down. If you think that's true, thumbs up. If you think it's false, thumbs down. Thumbs down. That's fantastic. Y'all are catching on here. Okay. So if somebody is having suicidal thoughts and they're in such a deep, dark place, they are so depressed, so down, they are so upset that they are thinking about taking his or her own life, rational thinking has gone out the window. Okay? So all that, you know, their family might love them. They might have kids that are important to them. They may have plans to go on vacation. They're not thinking about any of that. They are in such a dark place that rational thought has just gone out the window. Okay? And like I mentioned earlier, with suicide being the 10th leading cause of death, and we only hear about it in the news when it's, you know, somebody famous or um, has some notoriety of some sort. If you think back over the last year or so with the different celebrities who have taken their life, they had those things. They had family members. They were successful. They had plans. They were doing all that. They still died by suicide. Okay. So just because those things are in place doesn't mean that the individual isn't <coughs> thinking about suicide, it doesn't mean that they won't act on those thoughts. Okay. Any questions about the myths before I move on to the safe part, the signs, asking the question, validating and expediting care? Any questions about the myths or the statistics so far? Okay, so moving on. So SAVE, S-A-V-E, we're gonna start with the signs. <coughs> signs of suicidal thinking. Okay, what that looks like. Then we're going to go on to asking the most important question of all, validating the veteran's experience, and then the E is all about encouraging treatment and expediting care. And I'll show you how to, how to do that. <clears throat> so there are going to be some things, some warning signs that we need to take a look at that mm, these, are, these are important, and then we've got some that are like, oh my gosh, that is so critical, we need to address it right now. Okay. So signs of suicidal thinking. So if somebody is struggling with any of these things, it doesn't mean that they're having suicidal thoughts, but they might, okay? So think about somebody who's feeling hopeless. Things are never gonna get any better. Any of you work with veterans, talk with veterans who have said, man, this is just hopeless, whether they're applying for benefits or if it's a medical condition or, trying to make a change in their life one way or the other, okay? Anxiety, agitation, sleep issues, mood swings, folks having difficulty sleeping, either too much or too little. Folks <coughs> who have um, anger to, you know, something that might annoy us at a level three or four, but they're responding at a seven, eight, nine, They've gone over the top with their anger, like they're really agitated about stuff. Mm -hmm. Or they used to be cool, calm, and collected, but now everything sets them off. And you feel like you're having to walk on eggshells with them. Feeling like there's no reason to live. I've got nothing to live for. I'm getting older, I've got all these health issues, all my family members before me have passed away. What am I here for? What's the purpose in life? I talked about the anger and the rage, okay? It, engaging in risky behaviors without thinking. Folks are mixing alcohol with their medication, driving too fast, they don't care, riding motorcycles without their helmets, doesn't matter to them. Weaving in and out of traffic, eh, no big deal. They don't care, doesn't matter. If I get hurt, nobody will care. Okay? Increasing their drug or alcohol use, I'm not a veteran, let me just put that out there, but from what I hear, alcohol's a pretty common in the military. No. That's what I hear, I, that's what I hear, I don't know. I wasn't there. So, drink, so drinking or you know, alcohol use, I realize that that's part of the culture, but what if it's increasing? Okay, 
Or what if now they're mixing it with their medication where they didn't before? Or maybe they, you know, just drank on the weekends, but now they're drinking during the week too. When you see these little changes, okay, it's something to be aware of. Withdrawing from family and friends. Maybe they were coming to meetings all the time. Maybe they were showing up to work all the time, never called in sick. Maybe they get together with family functions and let's get together for the holidays. Nah, I'll just stay in my room. No, I'm not coming today. No, I'm calling in sick. What are some examples that you all have seen with the veterans that you're working with or family members or friends or neighbors? It doesn't have to be veterans. But what are some examples of these? Yes. You're listing uh, PTSD symptoms. The only thing that's not on there uh, that, that is wearing PTSD is just sitting, you can correct me, feeling like there's no reason to live. Mm -hmm. That would be a trigger when I was talking to a vet. Mm -hmm. All the rest of them were standard fair. Okay, so the hopelessness kind of falls into that with the no reason to live. What's the point? Okay. Uh, I don't see depression up there. Um, it's gonna, uh, it is included. Just give me a minute, I'm gonna slip into another slide. Frustration. Frustration, okay. You work with some folks who have experienced frustra expressed frustration <coughs> before, okay. Isolation. Isolation, absolutely. Well, I've had five friends, no, nobody's listening to me. They're older friends, really, in fact, they're older than me. They're the fathers of some of my friends and when they found out that they had incurable disease, mm -hmm. they went and shot themselves and did not tell their family nothing. They went, they, in fact, they had to go out five, six days later and find them in the woods. But okay. they were in the car with the gun out. I'm so sorry to hear that. But apps, medical diagnoses, when, when folks are struggling with right. different medical conditions, that can definitely be a trigger. I heard that nobody's listening to me. Yeah, I hear that one a lot. Yeah. Just nobody listens to me. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So feeling hopeless, feeling isolated, or like you just don't belong, having no sense of purpose. These are some really important warning signs. Yes, ma'am. Giving away prized possessions, mm -hmm. whether it's their military. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a, a big warning sign, big red flag there. And folks are giving away their prized possessions. Anybody have a, a t-shirt in their closet from, I don't know, 10 years ago? Oh, yeah. Favorite yeah. concert or yeah. you know, yeah. branch of the military yeah. or something? Yeah. Absolutely. Just one. Just one, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have a bunch, trust me. You know, but like, I can clean out everything else. I'm keeping that same t-shirt. It's got holes in it, it's stained, it's whatever, but it means something to me. It represents something, right? When folks are holding on to these things that may not have any monetary value at all, or it might, and they start giving things away, Absolutely. That is a warning sign. Yes, sir. You know, I, I see the same. You know, say, they say what makes a veteran feel hopeless a lot of times. When they go to VA for help, they don't get help. They get turned away. Mm -hmm. And see, a lot, I mean, I these, these signs on here, I mean, the, uh, the, the training is good. If the VA have people in the VA that go by, a lot of people in the VA don't go by. Now, if they come, a veteran needs help, and they overlook them, you know, and, and the veteran keep going. And you try to get veterans involved, then they go. And a lot of them say, well, I, I don't need for me to go to VA anyway. I'm not going to get any help. I don't try to. And that makes them feel hopeless. Well, I'm, I'm and you sure have a veteran try to talk to them, you know. And, and it's hard to talk to a veteran that after he's gone to the system, trying to get help. And every time he go, he get to say, he get turned away. I mean, you know, mm. and, and, and it makes them feel that way. Well, I, I do hate to hear that. I can't mm. speak for any any facility other than ours here it, in Orlando. It, I can tell you. they made me feel that way. That, mm. Well, I, I'm really yeah, I'm talking from experience. That is, That's how it made me feel. That is not what we want to have happen. Mm. Um, I can't speak for any facility other than Orlando where I am. I know mm -hmm. that our doors are open. Folks can come in, they can get care that same day. You show up, you tell somebody you need help, we are going to help you. We will figure out the paperwork later, we'll deal with the enrollment piece, we'll deal with whatever. Somebody needs help, we are going to see them. We are going to make sure that they get the care they need. So I am very sorry that you've had that experience or any veteran has had that experience because that is not what we want to have happen. Yes. So you listen to systemic uh, symptoms, but what about the side effects of medication? I'm going to leave that to the med providers. That is outside my realm of, of expertise. So I just want to, I want to work on the general, these are some signs for everybody, the layman, doesn't have to be a clinician or a med provider to see that 
these things could happen. We want to keep it general for the topic that we're focused on today. Meds absolutely have side mm -hmm. effects. I think it's really important for the mm -hmm. patient to talk to the doctor about what those might be. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to address that because I don't do meds and I'm going I'm to stay in my lane because I'm not getting in trouble with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> there are folks from Orlando here and they will tattle on me. <laughs> I do see your hands, but I want to keep going because I know that I'm on the time. Okay, so these are some of the things that are a bit more um, immediate. When we're seeing these things, when you're seeing these things in the individual that you're interacting with, red flags, exclamation points behind these, okay? Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that they get care. So if the person is telling you that they're thinking about suicide or if they're thinking about killing themselves, <clears throat> okay? Well, if they're telling you that they, they are, are, that's a big exclamation point and we need to, we need to take that seriously and we need to talk to them talk to them about getting some care immediately. I'll tell you how to do that um, as we move on. If they are actively looking for ways to die, doing Google searches or watching YouTube videos or asking questions, and they're trying to figure out like, well, you know, which way would be less painful? Which way would be the quickest? What should I do? When they are actively putting energy into finding a way to kill themselves, big red flag, we need to get them help immediately, okay? Talking about death or dying or suicide, they're talking to you about that, or family members. <clears throat> Excuse me. Taking those risky behaviors, self-destructive behaviors, particularly when it involves alcohol, drugs, or weapons. Because alcohol and drugs are going to reduce those inhibitions, so some things that they may not have done if they weren't mm -hmm. drinking, but they are drinking, so maybe they're doing something that they wouldn't have done otherwise. They may be a little more impulsive. Anybody in here, and you don't have to, this is not self-disclosure, I just want you to think, not actually answer out loud. You ever been drinking and then you ever did something while you were drinking that the next day you're like, I probably shouldn't have done that. My younger days, I folks can end up doing things that they may not have done otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's important that we address that. Okay. Yes? What would you say with a, uh, a veteran who will call you in the middle of the night and say he's okay, mm -hmm. um, but in fact they're going in the middle of the night and you know, suggest that it's not okay, but he won't come out and say, well, I'm thinking of hurting myself. How would you address that? I would address why he's calling, what's going on, um, and then depending on the rapport you have with the individual, maybe it's maybe you're able to discern kind of like what's going on. Does he really just need to kind of get something off his chest, or are you struggling? Anytime you have a question, I'm going to say let's let's send a health and safety checklist. Let's get a mental health professional involved or law enforcement involved to come and check on the individual if you if you've got any questions. Does he have family members there in the house? Will he let you talk to a family member? Talk to him until somebody else is there. Uh, if somebody's calling in the middle of the night, it's not because you know, they're just bored and want to say, hey. They're, they're generally dealing with something. Yes? It doesn't apply here in Florida, but what happens when somebody's living in a locale that, that offers assisted suicide assistance? Or yeah. they offer that. I mean, you're trying to talk them out of it. And they're looking in a locale that says, hey, this is the way to do it. You know, it's like somebody just brought up earlier that if, if somebody's, you know, having medical issues and stuff like that and they feel hopeless because it's like, this is never getting better, whatever they've got. Okay. 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 Yeah, so they come to suicide, uh, since the suicide, uh, there are a handful of states that you may know that uh, actually, uh, uh, that it's legal. Right, right, they just added another one this week. Yeah, and then there's also uh, the veteran homes. Uh, that are out in uh, some of those states. And the veteran homes uh, are uh, funded partially by the VA, uh, but I can tell you that the VA does not support assisted suicide. They came up with our office, the general counsel, uh, so the VA does not support assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. That's important uh, to know. But in counseling, that that acts as an obstacle. That's the only thing I'm gonna say, because you're, you're trying to incorporate certain types of common sense to people, and, and you're trying to readjust certain things. And at the same time, in, in certain areas, there's a lot of social input that yeah. says, 
This is yeah. an option. So, so the assisted suicide thing is it's a legal thing in the VA, but at the same time, uh, there are a lot of other uh, areas that, uh, that uh, influence uh, individuals. Social media, right? family problems, divorce. So I think mm -hmm. assisted suicide is just one more thing that will influence people uh, who you know, uh, may, may consider that. Uh, right? so, uh, but legally, the VA doesn't support it. But uh, when you talk about counseling, I think you have to consider all the different plethora of uh, influence that are in, in the nation today. I mean, it's just a lot. So. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm going to encourage you to, to keep in mind is the presentation that we're focused on today is the in general, okay, and what to look for and then what to do about it when you see it. That's going to be the assisted suicide is a more specific, individualized issue. Um, this is for somebody who uh, could need some help and are considering taking his or her own life and how you can be of assistance to that veteran in saving his or her life. Okay. Yes? What do you do with a veteran? I've been, just, I've been confronted by this more than once, who uh, displays the, the suicidal tendencies and when you question him about it, he says, he says, there's no way I tell myself, I tell somebody else, but not myself. How do you, how do you address that? Nine one one. Nine one one is excellent. So I'm going to be asking, like, well, who? Because you know, I'm just a nosy veteran and a clinician, and this is what I do. Uh, but you know, I would definitely, if they're thinking about killing somebody else, yeah, well, of course, we need to know about that. Um, that's an important topic that needs to be addressed by somebody who can do something about that. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. you did the right thing. Absolutely. So moving on to the A in the save is asking the all-important question. Okay. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Now, that can be a really difficult question to ask. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Notice I'm not asking, I'm not encouraging you to ask, are you thinking about harming yourself? Because somebody can harm themselves, and that's totally different than killing themselves. Totally different than suicide. This is pretty straightforward and to the point. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Okay. We want to be direct. We want to open up the conversation because we need to know, are they thinking about that? And if we're all shy and quiet and like, okay, don't talk about it, what are we telling the individual? Don't talk to us about that. Mm -hmm. But most, most of the time, as far as the veteran's concerned anyway, when that question is asked, the veteran's going to say no because he or she are afraid that if they answer yes, they're going to be taken away. <laughs> and that may be? Not maybe, um, it's, it's no yeah. fact. I've worked with a whole lot of veterans who have answered yes to that question. Really? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Absolutely. And as a mental health professional, folks also know how to listen to what the answers are, and we can ask in other ways. We can... Um, reassure them of what what constitutes needing to be hospitalized versus not. I mean there are conversations that can be had. Okay. But again, I'm not I'm not talking to a and I have no idea whether anybody in here is a mental health professional. Well, mm -hmm. That's not true. I know one mental health professional in here, but I don't know if the entire audience is a mental health professional, okay? If you're not, you don't have to know how to do that. I'm just encouraging you to ask the question ask the all-important question. And even for folks who have asked this a hundred times, it can still be a very difficult question to ask. So I want to give you an opportunity to ask it. I'm not turning this into a therapy session. I don't want you to turn to your neighbor and start you know, digging up all of this stuff. But I do want to, to ask the question, and I do see your hand. I do want to give you the opportunity to practice verbalizing the question, because it can be uncomfortable to ask. So as a group, I'm going to ask us to read it together off the screen. Ready? One, Are you? two, three. All right. Are you thinking about killing yourself? There you go. If you've never asked it no. before, you've had your first yes. Nope. Never, <laughs> never, never. Yes, ma'am. I find, and, I, and again, I am a nurse, and I've worked with veterans for 36 years now, and I can say that you would be absolutely shocked the number that just want you to ask. They yes. want it, they, they want you to validate they want you to say that you're listening. Yes. And it's not, you know, and if they say yes, 
you know, you can't be shocked about it. You've got to go on and find them help. But it's, we, everyone spends so much time thinking that they're not going to want to be asked. And I can tell you truthfully, many, many, many over the years have reinforced how much that means that we did ask. Absolutely. I agree completely. Remember the myths and realities of if I ask a question, it's going to be, they're going to do it. They're going to think about it. If we ask the question, it opens up the opportunity for them to say yes. Lots of folks really do want to answer that question. There's kind of a little side note. I don't know if you've ever heard of Kevin Hines, and I did see your answer. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Kevin Hines, but he is a suicide attempt survivor. He jumped off of the Golden Gate Bridge, one of the few survivors that has done that. And he's written several books and created movies, and he has spent his life telling his story. And the short version is he was on the Golden Gate Bridge thinking about suicide. He was thinking about jumping. He had he crawled over the railing. There's a little, a little ledge there. And he kept thinking, if somebody would just come up and ask me, mm -hmm. if somebody would just show that they cared, I won't jump. Mm. And about that time, here comes a woman walking up to him. And she said, sir, sir. And he's like, oh, somebody, somebody's asking me. Will you take my picture? Oh, oh no. So he takes her picture. <laughs> she says, thank you. And she leaves. And he jumps. And he jumps. Mm. Mm. What? And he survived. Faith-based, I'm going to say thank you, Lord, that he survived because now he is yeah. spending his life talking to others about the importance of asking that question, showing you care. It's a very important question, one you can ask me. Now, I had you read it together out loud. There are other ways that you can word it. Are you thinking about suicide or having thoughts of taking your own life? However you're going to ask that question, if the time comes for you to do so, Please be direct. Again, we're not, or are you harming yourself? Are you thinking about ways that you could hurt yourself? There are so many things that folks can do to harm themselves that are totally different than ways to, to die by suicide. Okay, please ask the question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was just going to make that point. You have to be very direct. Yes. You can't say, well, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? No, you've got to be very direct to them. <laughs> You read my slides ahead of time. So the things that I am going to encourage you to not do, don't ask the question as you're looking for a no response, as the gentleman just said. You're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? What am I telling the person to say to me? Don't, no. don't tell me. Because if you tell me, i got to do something about it, and I don't know what to do about it. So please don't tell me. Okay. Also, don't ask them just as the you know, conversation is dying down, just as they're about to leave or you're about to go. Like, let's not, like, oh, see you later. Um, you weren't thinking about killing yourself, right? <laughs> okay, see ya. We don't want to do that, okay? Because you're shutting the person down. You are not putting that welcome mat out there for them to talk to you about the thoughts that they're struggling with. What you're doing is you're shutting them down. You're saying, please don't talk to me. Please don't tell me what you're thinking, okay? What we do want to do is we want to we wanna ask the question, but tell them why you're asking. You know, I noticed that you've not been coming to the meetings lately, and you used to be here all the time, like we've really missed you. Is something going on? And then as they're talking and you're listening, and you know, the conversation goes, have it flow into the conversation. You know, well, the things that you're telling me about, I've heard of those similar stories from a lot of other veterans. And some of those veterans have thought about suicide. Have you been thinking about suicide? Have you been thinking about taking your own life? Work it into the conversation. We don't want it to be an interrogation where they're sitting in the chair and shining the spotlight on them. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Like, we're not doing that. We want to be able to open up that conversation. Okay, we want to reduce the stigma. If it's okay for you to talk about it, we're letting them know it's okay for them to talk about it. Okay? So like I said, that can be a really difficult question to ask. If you have never asked that question, or if you've asked it a hundred times, it can be a difficult question to ask. Anybody familiar with ducks? Anybody ever see a duck on the water? Yep. Okay. If you think about the water and the duck is floating along, swimming along, on the surface, the duck's just kind of gliding around really gracefully across the top. What's happening under the water? Yep. Working those little feet, right? They're just paddling, working as hard as they can. Think about a duck, okay? So if you're interacting with somebody and you're concerned about them, 
and your radar is going off, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is like that stuff that I heard about at the DAV conference. Like, I'm seeing the warning signs, and I feel like I'm supposed to ask the question, and gosh, this is the point. And you're really nervous, and you're like, what am I going to do if, if I ask this question and they answer yes? Like, what am I going to do? Be that duck. On the outside, cool, calm, and collected. On the inside, you could be the nervous Nelly, your heart is racing, your mouth is dry, your foot's shaking under the table and you really hope that they can't see that because you're just so nervous and anxious. It's okay to be nervous. It's okay to be anxious. Okay? Stay calm on the outside. Never let them see you sweat kind of thing. Okay? Maintain eye contact with the person that you're talking with. If you're really concerned about that person, let it show in the way you're talking to them. If they're talking to you and you're looking off somewhere else and you've got your face in your phone and you're swiping on social media and you're scrolling up like, oh, look at that, Uncle Joe posted that, oh, look at this. Are you letting that person know that you care? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I should know. Do you think that they're going to feel comfortable opening up to you about something as sensitive as thinking about taking their life? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But what if you stop what you're doing, you put down your phone or whatever it is you've got with you, and you face them? And you make eye contact. And you listen. What kind of message is that going to send? Oh, yeah. interest. Did I hear them? Did I care? Did... Someone's listening. I'm Somebody interested. is listening. I'm interested. Absolutely. You're giving them your time. And what better gift for somebody who is struggling with the thoughts of taking their own life? Remember that number. As of today, if we're thinking 20 a day, 4,300 people have died, veterans have died by suicide. What if you just take the time, put down your phone, and talk to them, and ask the difficult question? Show them you care. Have that open posture. If I'm standing here and I'm talking to somebody, and I'm tapping my foot, and I'm shuffling back and forth, Body language. Yes, right. Keep your, your body language open. Lean in. Make that eye contact. Let them know you care. Be supportive and encouraging. Please don't judge them. Please don't judge them. Even if you think that they have no reason to be feeling this way, guess what? <laughs> They're feeling this way. Okay. The B is validating. Let's validate their experience. Repeat back to them what they just shared with you. I, I, I hear you telling me you're having a really difficult time. I hear that you're in pain. I understand yourself, you're telling me that you miss your spouse or your battle buddies didn't come home or this or that, whatever it is. Give it back to them. Let them know you hurt them. Validate for them that they are hurting. Again, don't judge. Anybody in here ever been like angry or upset and you're like just really tripped off about something and somebody's like, get over it. Don't be mad about that. Did that make your anger go away? No. no. It didn't for me. I can tell you that. It didn't for me. Increase it. If anything, it's like, what do you mean? And my anger just kind of went up like a notch or two, right? Okay. So just because you don't think they should be feeling that way or thinking that way doesn't mean that they're not. Reflect that back to them. I hear that you're having a tough time. I hear that it's not easy for you. Validate it and remind them that there is help available to them. Treatment works. There are no quick, easy answers. There's not a magic pill that anybody can prescribe that all this depression and the sadness and everything that they're dealing with is going to go away today and they won't ever experience it again. But things can get better. Treatment works. Be there for them. Okay? And the E, the final letter, is encouraging treatment and expediting care if needed. Okay? So what to do if somebody is suicidal? Don't keep it a secret. Tell a family member that somebody at work, tell a, a supervisor. If they're in an, in an imminent crisis, don't leave them alone. 
are with okay. the wet fish. Stay with them when you were asking, like, oh, somebody's on the phone and you're talking to them. Don't leave them alone. Okay? Don't end that call until somebody else is there. Try to get that person to seek help. We're going to talk about ways to, to do that. The crisis line is available. Law enforcement is available. The VA is available. Okay? Encourage them to go to the nearest emergency room or go with them. Okay. The Veterans Crisis Line, anybody heard of that? Please say yes. Okay, good. Yay, okay. Anybody know the number? 1-800-273-8255. There you go. Let's say it together. 1-800-273-8255. Press 1. Press 1. Who's pressing 1? The veterans are. Absolutely. So the 1-800-273-8255, that's the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. That's for anybody. Veterans are going to press 1. That's going to connect them with the Veterans Crisis Line. That's going to get them connected to the local VA hospital. Okay? Yes, ma'am. One suggestion we have is put it in your cell phone because you're not going to remember it. Absolutely. Y'all have, have y'all been to my presentation before? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to invite you to put this number into your phone. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, I, I deal with veterans, and I talk to several veterans, and they say when they call that number that they get put on hold. Mm. You know, they don't have support calls for the veterans. Wow. We try really hard not to do that, mm. um, but in all honesty, we have X number of responders, and if we have more calls than we have responders, we'd rather answer the phone and say, hold on a second, than not answer it at all. We also have backup centers. Um, we have three Veterans Crisis Line centers, but then we have local backup centers for when our centers just have more calls than they can take. We answer as many calls as we absolutely can on the first time. We don't want to put folks on hold. Mm -hmm. Logistically, sometimes we just have more callers than we have responders to answer the call. Yeah, need to increase. We don't like for that to happen, but it does. Um, veterans can also text. Veterans can also get online, and I'll, I'll share those um, with you in just a minute. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of my questions was, what happened when you call that line? But does the VA have a mobile response team? Some VAs are partnering with local law enforcement where they go out with the law enforcement. Some law enforcement just have the crisis intervention teams, not necessarily a VA staff person. So that, that's dependent on the VA and what part of the country and, and where they are. Can I recommend a mobile response team? Well, that would be totally awesome for all of us. Um, <laughs> I Feel mean, free to send that up the food chain and talk to Congress and let them send us some more money. Trust me, we would, we would definitely put some resources to use, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I do see hands, and I, I definitely will get to your, to your questions. I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity. Okay? But when it comes, I want to finish up the E part. So when we're talking with folks, if you happen to be engaging with somebody who has a weapon, again, we talked about firearms, most people mm -hmm. meet. Safety comes first, yours included. If somebody has a firearm, firearm on them and they're thinking about using it and you're aware of that, get yourself to a safe place. Exactly. Call law enforcement. Okay, if you're law enforcement in the room, that's your job to deal with that. If you're not law enforcement in the room, call law enforcement. That's their job. Let them deal with that. Okay? If somebody has actively overdosed or done something else to poison themselves in some sort of way and they need medical care, call 911, let the ambulance come and address that. That's not the time to go, well, so are you having thoughts of killing yourself? <laughs> and this lady at the DAV conference, she said that I should validate your experience. It, it's been tough for you. If they've already acted on it, they need medical attention. Please let the, the medical professionals <laughs> deal with that. Okay. Is it a good idea to stay with them? Absolutely. Uh, well, minus the gun situation now. Like, I, I, I don't want you to put your safety at risk, okay? I'm very, very serious about that one. So, again, we've got the number up here. Veterans Crisis Line, 1-800-273-8255. Okay. If it's not busy. So, um, as you go through, when, we call, when I encourage folks to call the crisis line, the veteran can call. A family member can call, a friend can call, an anonymous person can call. Okay? If you're working with a veteran and you know you think that it could help the veteran to talk to the responder, dial the number with them. Like, here, let me sit with you. Let me let me call these people. 
Let's call them together. Okay, crisis line? Yeah, I'm working with this veteran. Sure, hold on, here she is. And pass the phone over to the veteran. Okay? When the veterans call the crisis line and the responders there, or they can text or they can get online, the, the VCL responder sends that information to the local VA. So if the veteran is in Orlando, it comes to me. If they're in Tampa, it goes to the Tampa <coughs> folks. If they're in South Dakota, it goes to the South Dakota folks. Okay? And it lets the suicide prevention coordinator at that facility know, hey, a veteran in your area called the crisis line, and this is what they called about. And then the suicide prevention coordinator at every VA reaches out to that veteran. Hey, we know you called the crisis line. We wanted to check in with you. How are you doing? Okay. Maybe it's, oh, I had a fight with my spouse and I just needed somebody to, to talk to. Or maybe they were struggling with suicide. And first responders needed to show up. And they ended up in the hospital. We still call. Okay. Regardless of what was going on, we're going to touch base with that person. Here in Orlando, we are busy, busy, busy with the crisis line, which is awesome, job security for me, but it also means that we are helping a lot of veterans out there. We are within the top 10 in the country for responding to crisis line. We are number two in Florida. North Florida, South Georgia beat us just by like less than 200. Okay. We've had over 1,500 calls that we've responded to. Veterans get followed up with. Yes. Hi. I have a, a question and then a couple comments. First of all, um, can we do anything about simplifying the numbers so that it's more easily remembered? That's, that's I mean, it's just a try. Again, I know it's resources and people already have it and there's a lot of other considerations, but that was just a try. Mm -hmm. And comment-wise is I just wanted to validate you for so many points that you brought up that are workable and applicable that people are not usually aware of. That, you know, they can now work with and think with. I think that's valuable, right? My last comment was I wanted to respond to the gentleman back there on medication. And I know this is outside your purview, but there is a bill, H.R. 100, uh, the Veteran um, the veteran Prevention, sorry, Veteran Over Medication Prevention Act, and they are going to be studying, I mean, if the passive that is, they're going to be studying whether there's any links between the suicides and the <coughs> medications. Simply because the first side effect on the most of the drugs is that there's suicide and has you know, depression and anxiety. These are side effects. So I think they should at least take a look and hopefully they will. Yes. Okay. So it can be side effects as advertised on TV right, and not exactly. staying within my scope. Exactly. Um, thank you very much for your comments. And as far as the getting a different number, that's being talked about by the powers that be. Right. Um, logistically, it's there's a lot to work out with that. 911 is taken, 211 is taken, 611 is taken. What do we do and how do we, and then how do we get that out? And then we have to rebrand everything. Know that it is a topic of conversation. Folks are looking at it and then trying to, to find a way to do that. Absolutely. So. 8255 spells talk. That's yes. how it was originally branded. Yes, it does. Yes. So 1-800-273-8255, T-A-L-K. So who in here has a cell phone? with them. I'm going to invite you to pull that out. And I'm going to invite you to program this number into your phone. Excellent. Fantastic. Now I also brought um, some some goodies, some swag, if you will, that I'll take out and spread out on a table somewhere that you're welcome to um, take one of when you leave. Crisis line cards, like you see in the picture here, um, are among the things that I brought today. I want you to pass the number out. Pass the cards out, okay? Even though I brought some, wherever you go back, your local suicide prevention coordinator and the mm -hmm. local VA, they have cards. Mm -hmm. Ask them for some so that you can pass them out. Give them out like candy on Halloween. The only way that this number is going to help a veteran is if the veteran has the number, okay? But I encourage you to put it in your phone because if you run out of cards or you're out in the middle somewhere of, I don't know, you're not even working, but you just happen to run into somebody who's like, oh, hey, and you find out, gosh, I really wish I had that number. We don't go anywhere without our phones these days. So if you have it programmed into your phone, you've already got it. So if you'll program Veterans Crisis Line or VCL, however you want it in your contacts, 1-800-273-8255. And if you want to put down in the little notes section, Veterans Press 1. Yes, ma'am. All of us give out 
basically gift packs when we go to our uh, state conventions as well as like we got here at national. Uh -huh. And then one of the best things in the world is talking to your crisis prevention person and getting the swag to tuck in those gift bags. Yes. Because then you actually have a lot of it at home to hand out. Mm -hmm. um, our crisis prevention person actually gave us bags, a lot of the swag we put in, and it actually went, it, that way it covers your entire state in a matter of minutes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's fun stuff that veterans like to have. Depending on you know what your site has or your area has available, there are koozies and potato chip clips for bags and kick stands and bandanas for riding motorcycles and gun you know, crisis line cards, all kinds of different things. Gun locks? Gun locks. <clears throat> gun locks are available as well. I did not bring any gun locks, mm. um, but gun locks are available. So I just want to make sure that you've got some additional resource information. Um, if you go to va.gov, you can find out information about the mental health services that are available. We also have vet centers. Are y'all familiar with vet centers? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, then I won't spend any time talking about mm -hmm. what the vet centers are. We also have Make the Connection, where veterans can get online and talk to other veterans and family members about different topics, health issues. <coughs> Specific for PTSD, we've got the ptsd.va.gov, okay, so that there's a list of resources available for veterans who are um, struggling with PTSD. And here's all the information about the Veterans Crisis Line. So the 1-800-273-8255, Veterans Press 1. They can go online, veteranscrisisline.net, and chat with somebody online. They can text, because a lot of folks prefer to text instead of call. Maybe they want that little level of anonymity where, okay, I don't really want the other person on the other end of the phone to hear me crying and bawling like a baby and like struggling like I am, so let me just text it out to them. That's fine. Again, those same things get routed to the suicide prevention coordinator at the local VA. We still reach out to those veterans. And then the veteranscrisisline.net resource locator, you click on that. You can look up any state, any zip code, whatever you want, and you can find the local VA, you can find the local suicide prevention coordinator, figure out who's in the area where you are. You'll have the name, the phone number, contact information, you can call the veterans and call as long as we're getting any help. So just to recap, first aid, that acronym, what's the S stand for? Signs. Yes, signs of suicidal thinking. What's the A? S. What's the, what are we asking? Are you going to hear yourself? Yay! Excellent. B. What's the B? Validating. 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 What's the E? And expediting courage. Absolutely. So hopefully you've learned a few things um, during this presentation. If you've got some questions, now it's going to be a great time to ask. I saw the gentleman in the back, then I saw your hand, and then I saw yours in the back. Just uh, in your in your research, have you found any any correlation, and, and this is specific to veterans, between crime and the judicial system? I personally have not. Um, our, some of our VJO, the Veterans Justice Outreach Program, may have some of those statistics. I don't have any of. I mean, the reason for the question is. If you and I are convicted of the same crime, and I'm a veteran and you're not, uh -huh. I'm going to serve eight years more than you because I'm a veteran. No. I yeah. don't have well, that research that, to back yeah, that. The part, that's the yeah. Department of Justice 2017 study. Okay. I, I, again, I don't have the research on that one. Okay. Um, I can tell you that I work with our Veterans Justice Outreach folks. One of the things that can increase suicidal risk is having some legal issues. I'm going to leave all of that to the VJO person. I know that we work really hard to help the veteran not be involved in the system, to get them back out into the community. I'm, I'm not going to... And ladies and gentlemen, no, before we ask any more questions, please keep it within the realm of the topic being spoken. That way we don't waste anybody's time and those that have a, a question that need to be answered can get it answered before the subject matter experts leave. The DOJ question, excellent question. I've got a note that I've just taken down. We'll follow up and see what we got to do with that, okay? So keep your questions mm -hmm. pertinent to the uh, topic. Thank you. Okay, I saw it. Are you open to tips and tricks? Um, tips and tricks on keeping veterans alive, absolutely. Cool. Uh, what? Karen, I have a few passes over. 
<clears throat> uh, I have had uh, looked down the barrel of 38 when I asked the veteran, are you thinking about killing yourself? Hmm. He reached in, pulled 38 out, and said, I'm going to do it with this. And he went like this. I learned that there are tips <coughs> and tricks to avoiding that. Before you ask the question, are you thinking about killing yourself? You want to disarm the vet. Mm. And this is how you do it. This is a um, state of Indiana license to carry handgun life. Can't see you. I haven't owned a gun Can't since I left the one. service 30 That's years ago. Oh. I got this card to use as a, as a tip. Mm. You pull out your card and say, have you ever seen one of these? They will pull theirs out. And then you're talking about your handgun. Mm -hmm. That's how you disarm them. Let me see your keys. And if you're in court, you know how to, uh, how to uh, drop a clip. You drop the clip and you hand them the gun back. Then you ask him the question. <laughs> Yeah. One of our service officers of Chapter 123 from Merritt Island, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, her son, when he came out of the military, committed suicide. I think that's one of the reasons she's one of our service officers. <coughs> what we do and what she does, she uses the number 22. And we will, on special occasions, 4th of July, Veterans Day, uh, Patriots Day, Christmas. We take 660 flags in different locations and we place them. Under each flag, we place one, a solar light. And of course, when the sun goes down, that will light up each flag. Each flag represents, and there is a sign in front to make the public aware of what's going on. Each veteran, each day that is killed. And we have gotten a great response to that. And we have been able to give your message or a similar message to the public. Here, that in itself is an award. I appreciate any outreach well, efforts well, to, to raise now. awareness. I so. think you might know. So I, I very well may. I very well may. Yes, sir, in blue shirt. I'd like to know if the video and or slides will be made available. Yes. Can be. Yes. So, so, so if you want the slides uh, for the suicide prevention, so there's a couple things. So there's actually a, a uh, prescribed uh, suicide prevention training that's a YouTube, and I'll send it to the mic. It's out publicly because uh, actually provided to the Lab Church of Latter-day Saints uh, for them to uh, employ it uh, as the trainer trainer. So I can get that to uh, to Mike to give to you all, uh, right? I mean the entire your your presentation, like chapter's presentation. I'm actually recording this. We're going to put it on DAV's YouTube, so okay. it's not up tonight. It'll be up tomorrow. That's what I need to know. Yep. Okay. Okay. And um, basically, what I did here, if you go to Psych Armor, P S Y C H A R M O R, um, it's a video. Somebody standing here, much like I did, with the information scrolling. She takes much less time. She's about 30 minutes when she's what doing her Psych Armor. Dot com, cool and you can uh, carry that way. I do see your two hands. I had this lady, gentleman in the red shirt, and then I'll go on to the two. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering how long it takes for the SBA coordinator to contact somebody back from the veteran crisis hotline. So, what's the protocol on that for the time? When we're notified, we have 24 hours to make our um, first attempt to contact. We make up two, three. If we're unable to contact the veteran for whatever reason, then we send them a letter to say, hey, we're here. Please give us a call. We've been trying to get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. Sir in the red shirt, did you have your hand up earlier? Yes, I did. Yes. She has a question. I, I've had my hand up for like a <laughs> while. Wow, I, I am so, so sorry. I was not doing that on purpose. I did not see it. I, I wanted to say if a, if you if you somebody said about getting the police, you know, can you get? I think it was you talked about getting the police over or something. Mm -hmm. I remember you said it. Mobile but, response, you mean? Yeah, more like if if they call and the person is suicidal. You know, does the response does the police go? There's something called a safe at in Florida. I don't know if it's safe in Florida. I'm with you. Safe and health check. 
and the police officers in the state of Florida, oh, if well, you Mr. feel Jeff. like somebody mm -hmm. is endangering yeah. themselves on the sidewalk, so oh, you well, can go and, yeah. and talk to a police officer and request a safe and health mm -hmm. check. And we've done that before, and we have found people that are unconscious. We have found mm -hmm. people that were orders. We have found people that have tried to kill themselves. We found all types of people. Mm -hmm. So if you're concerned about somebody, um, there is something <coughs> called a safe and health welfare check. And if any police officer in the state of Florida is allowed to do that particular check. Mm -hmm. So if somebody didn't call you back and you're calling a veteran, and I've had it happen, and they, they sound really depressed. I do veterans treatment court. And they sound really depressed, and I can't go back. I will call a police officers and say, hey, I'm Debbie Mann, we're in Veterans Treatment Court, and I have a vet here that has not responded, and I know he has been suicidal in the past. Can you please do a health and welfare check? Mm -hmm. And they have done that, and they have knocked on his door, and my particular gentleman had taken something for pain. I don't know how much he took for pain. All I know is a police officer called me and said, he's in the hospital, but he's fine. So Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know if it's and if, a state. And if he's not fine, they can take him to the hospital or call the ambulance. Is it, I don't know if it's nationwide or something in Florida. We have wellness checks yes. in most states. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you for your, for your presentation. I, I just wanted to offer another resource. Okay. And you had one of the apps up there, but the VA has launched a beautiful suite of apps. Yes. And, and if you do the VA launch pad, just put that one on your phone and then go down and say improve my mental health. And it's mm. so many apps. You had that one up there, but it's so many there that can help you yes. and you can go through these apps yourself. So, Absolutely. I mean, kudos to the VA for uh, uh, doing this. And I mean, it's a lot of them. There, and there, there are. are. And there, there are. are excellent. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad you said that. There are also some in there that have the safety plan in there so a veteran can create his or own safety plan. When they're struggling, they can refer to that safety plan. That's right. They have a plan prior to having to act on something. And I saw another gentleman, yes, sir. I, I made a mistake. I took the gun from the man. Mm. But I didn't send him no way. I took him to my office and I sat down and talked with him. Now, that was because I was just got out of CPE school. She <laughs> was school education. And it was through talking to him, I know he was going to do something wrong. So I took him to my office and I sat down and I talked to him. And he went on home. And the next month, he called me and wanted me to marry him. Uh, <laughs> and he became my friend. And I did not give him that gun back until maybe five years later. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm okay now. I'm not going to do anything to myself. Mm -hmm. And he came by my house. I gave him the gun. He said, I'm going to give it to my sister. Mm -hmm. I took his word for it. But I won't do that no more. You know, sometimes you think that training that you get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It didn't help that time. I ain't gonna try it no more. I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, I am. Glad too. it worked out. Both of them. Oh yes, ma'am. I just want to say that um, sitting here um, kind of brought back the thing for me. Um, it's kind of touchy. Um, I don't want any of us in this room to take for granted because we're in this room that we're exempt from what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. Even right. Superman had kryptonite and he needed somebody to come along and help him from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times as pastors, as clinicians or whatever, I notice in my own life that I have a tendency to save everybody else mm -hmm. and then forget about myself. Mm -hmm. And so we'll every time then I have to go back and if I'm going back whenever I get back because with a couple of things that you said that kind of bothered me. Um, and just go back and just continue to seek help and just continue to deal with your own issues mm -hmm. and your own stuff because a lot of times we deal with other people and we just leave ourselves hanging. Mm -hmm. And um, so, That's anyway, I don't know whether that works. Thank you for everything mm -hmm. you're doing. I gotta go see some people when they get back, so. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you for, for bringing that up. It's an excellent reminder. I addressed it like early on. I'm, it's a nice way to bring it back around. None of us are exempt. From this. No. this could happen to anybody, your friend, your neighbor, you, 
your children, your parents, your spouse, your siblings, okay? Remember that 1-800-273-8255 is for everybody. It's the Veterans Press mm -hmm. 1 if you're a Veteran Press 1. If you're not, that number is still available to you. Uh, Ms. Shannon, before uh, another question is asked, ladies and gentlemen, the National Commander has just texted me and says he needs to see me immediately. So, Mr. Washington, would you mind closing? Uh, you got until 4:45. You and Janet ask more questions. I'm sorry I have to leave, but when the boss calls, I got to go. So the reality of it is, please take away from everything you've learned today is that we're not subject matter experts. We don't didn't train you to be. Know how to recognize know who to call. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. I'm not dismissing you because there's questions that need to be asked and, 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 and Conrad and Janet, uh, I have asked for them to come to do this uh, seminar. We give you knowledge as a chaplain so that you have, chaplain is just more than a position, guys. All right, it's just more than a position. It gets deep. And this is just a part of a bigger picture. So I want to thank uh, Conrad Washington for coming. Ms. Chan, I want to thank you personally. Thank you for coming here and, and uh, doing my work for me. I appreciate it. Can you give us your phone number before you leave? Okay, phone number. I'm going to regret this. <laughs> yes, you will. All right. Now, all I ask is when I give you my phone number, when you text me, leave many of you one of me. I'm not going to remember who you are. So say, this is who I am, this is the department I'm with, and I'll say, got it. All right? 706. 457-7020. Now, I do have LifeLock, so I'm not concerned from that aspect. All right, text me first. All right, let me know who you are, and we'll go from there. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Conrad and Janet. Thanks again, guys. Thank Appreciate y'all. Thanks for coming by. And hopefully we can get together before you all take off. Um, I don't always... Who wants me to do it? Right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, sir. Good luck. I don't know if we can do it today, though. Sorry. I wanted to say that I missed a few appointments because uh, I used working at Excuse. That new iPad with the video, I think it's great. And I cannot emphasize enough. I, I think it's great because it's taken away that excuse of mine of missing because of it work or something like that. And again, it's got a number of different apps on there that I've been looking at and so forth. So uh, I think it's a great idea. So folks don't know about it, if you could explain shortly. For the apps? Well, the, the, the iPad in general and then the apps that go with it. Um, I'm not going to be the subject matter expert on that iPad. I turn on my computer and I turn off my computer and that's about the extent of technology for me and I'm not engaging um, in, in direct care with the veteran where I'm presenting it. I do know that um, we have some iPads available for certain veterans under certain conditions, but do you have more information? Yeah, on? well the apps, 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 now it's the primary, who knows what it is? VA.gov, they're say VA.gov. VA.gov. You get to VA.gov, it will link you to everything. Everything you want, benefits, health, suicide, my office, minority veterans, women veterans, you name it. VA.gov is your one-stop shop. Yep. And then, yep, and here's the, specifically, this is not the VA.gov, this is veteranscrisisline.net. Uh, resource locator so you can find your local suicide prevention coordinator the me out there in whatever other area that's where you go to find that person did i have yes ma'am uh we're in what richmond virginia and uh what they've done at rva is wonderful we service a lot of our mental health group which considers to be a community group that comes in they're homeless veterans who knows what they are but they can come off the streets and so we've got a lot of issues going on and you never know what the person's thinking. So even though you're trained, you got to remember not to be on top of a staircase when you're in front of them. <laughs> Look out what they got on. See if there are any bulges or anything for guns that they may have hidden. There's just so many things that you have to be really careful with and not take everything into your own hands. But when you call 804-675-5000 in Richmond, Virginia for the VA, the very first thing comes on is the uh, suicide hotline the very first thing and they text you back and we have the mobile situation going on 
And, and then if you walk in, within that first 20 minutes, you sign the little ledger in front of a lady, someone comes out in 20 minutes, and then we also advise them to go to the ER if they need uh, something and they can get their medicines or whatever right away. So someone sees them ASAP. And it's been a long time coming, but finally we're seeing some great, and then they have steps where they see clinicians going into, into different levels mm -hmm. so that they can help the level that that veteran is in, not necessarily another person's. Yep, because everybody's yeah. different, and everybody's reading has a different So we're hoping that it goes across the United needs. States. And, and, and the cards, everybody's cards, recognized all over the United States. Not that deep. Glad to hear it. Really and here in the front, yes ma'am. Yes, I'd just like to go back to the statement that you made about the crisis line and the, um, the crowdedness where people were not able to answer the first, and you said you had local, um, I guess, centers where they would take the overflow of the phones? Mm -hmm. Yep. Why would a call go on hold? I mean, I used to manage call centers, so I'm wondering why are they not just immediately going on to the overflow? Because the overflows get full too. Okay, we, so have, we, we have so have many. Um, there are not enough, okay. not enough responders in the area. Sometimes we have more calls. Those are rare circumstances, at least from what I'm hearing. I don't work on the crisis line side. I'm on those like okay, so okay. after after they call the crisis line. That's when they show up um, on on my radar. Right. <clears throat> but it, it's rare. But it does happen mm -hmm. um, every now and again. And uh, Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we got a lot of folks that are struggling. Mm -hmm. Like I said, a million exactly. people are dealing with. And I just have one other question regarding the chaplains. I, mean, I, do, I did get here in time, and I apologize for that. Another commitment, but I want to know: Did you do a self-help before you uh, talked about the um, save, the acronyms of save? Did you do a self-help of how the chaplains should take care of themselves? Because it is hard to service someone else without knowing the proper things to take care of yourself and self -help. So I'm going to address that in just one second. Okay. Uh, just a few more questions. I'm going to wind down. Yeah, we have more questions for Janet, and I, I want to wind down with a couple of things. Okay. I'm going to address that. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, sir. I, I don't have no question. I'm getting ready to go, too. And I had a purpose for coming to this meeting because I think that every chapter need to be certified as a service officer. You don't have to do the training, but your people will need some information. And you can get the right information to them as you become a service officer. I've been a service officer for 20 years. I have did a, a claim since I became a chapter, but I did something before I became a chapter. So you need to do that. And for this man, did you say something about somebody we get more time? Yeah. South Carolina has a special court for veterans. Mm -hmm. They won't get no more time than they do because they go to the veteran court and they may not get any time. Yeah. Yeah, it's veterans court. Yeah. 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 So, and a lot of states are concerned with veteran court thing. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's give John a hand. As Conrad wraps up the uh, swag that I told you I brought, I'm going to take it out and put it on one of the tables out here in the lobby as Conrad's wrapping up with the different things that need to be addressed, including the questions. Yeah, so, 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 so just a couple things real quick. I'm about to hold the lady and get out of here. Uh, to your question, uh, we are even a chapter training. So uh, within the Department of Veterans Affairs, we have a... Uh, uh, can't hear him because you're talking people. You can't hear Hold on. Is that better? Yes. Here we go. It's okay. I don't mind using the mic. I'm under the weather, so pray for me. <laughs> so in the uh, in the VA, we have uh, uh, a chaplain, uh, VA chaplain corps, right? Uh, National uh, Veterans Chaplains. It's led by uh, uh, Dr. Chaplain or Chaplain Dr. However you want to put the the, uh, the, uh, the credentials there, uh, Juliana um, Leshner. She's new. She took uh, Chaplain McCoy's place. Some of you may know who he is. And so I bring it up because uh, when I go out and partner with organizations, specifically uh, clergy leaders throughout the nation, pastors, uh, we have a special training just for them. And that training goes into detail about how to take care of themselves before they go out and take care of someone else. Does that make sense? Yes. So uh, my, my, my 
ask from you is, or my, my, my thing to you is, please know that uh, my office, the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiative, is the front door for all faith-based nonprofit community organizations for the VA. Right? So whatever you need, come to Conrad. If I don't have it, which likely I don't, but I can get you to the right place. Does that make sense? So please know that. A couple things I want to address real quick, and I'll sit and take my seat and we'll close. Uh, we'll talk about chapter training. I want you to know there's something called Special Services for Veteran and Families. You've probably heard of SSVF, or the HUD Bash, right? Some of those programs. Uh, I want to pause and just share with you that as chaplains and, and, and people who care about veterans, for years they've kept statistics on the number of veterans taking their lives, right? And for years, that number hasn't decreased, right? Am I giving a soapbox, but I think you will agree that now I think our country, our leadership is recognizing that it takes more than programs to serve people. It takes some type of, well, hope and resiliency for them to deal with their issues in life. And I believe that that is why we have the Center for Faith, because through faith, we can heal our veterans. And I really believe that. Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. I'm a junior in Orlando, and um, I had something come to me knowing I was a chaplain, and asked me, she's trying to get through the HUD bash. They told her no because they wouldn't accept her because she's not an alcoholic or a drug addict. Mm. And I talked to a couple other people who have gone through HUD bash that do not have a drug or alcohol problem. Yeah. And when I shared that to her, then she got really mad, and I'm like, oh. Yeah. So, 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 the, I just, oh, yeah, I so let me interject. So, so. As I travel around in the last year and a half, going to different places, and I've been all over churches and organizations, uh, we have to be authentic, and I want to be authentic with you, right? Here's authenticity. The VA is the second largest federal agency, right? When you have an organization that large, that, that means that when I come out to Orlando, I can reach out to Janet and say, hey, I need a trained suicide prevention coordinator who has credentials. I can go to any state and get that. That's pretty large, right? Because of that, I'm not making excuses, I'm just being authentic with you. There are going to be issues. And I can tell you the number of things I've written down throughout when I went to Mississippi, Oklahoma, I can go down the line. There are always going to be issues. Even with those veterans who go to the VA and can't get the proper support and customer service that they deserve, you can go to Wendy's sometimes and get poor service. Right? And then you can go back and get the better service, right? So, and I'm not making light of that because that's not right. But I just yeah, want to share with you, we must encourage one another. And as men and women of faith in this room, here I go. That's all right. <laughs> That's why we are here, to encourage people. Am I right? Yes. To encourage them and let them know that it's not over. The story isn't over. There's more to it than this. Right? So we need to, when they have a bad experience, we have to acknowledge it. Right? And then say, hey, look, pick, your, pick, pick yourself back up. Because what I tell veterans is, the same resiliency and intensity and I can use all kind of adjectives that got you through the military, through boot camp. Whether you served one year or 20 years like I did in combat or not, guess what? I need you to use that same resiliency to fight for your life right here on this side as a civilian. Right? How do you help somebody like that? Because now, can I help somebody? So, so with that being said, so, so with that being said, we have homeless coordinators. Get with me afterwards. I'll get the case and I'll, and I'll get involved. Is that fair? Yes, so just to let you guys know as well, when you come, so there's all kinds of situations when you go to the VA hospital, they don't always know how the programs and processes work. I still, when before I transferred out of Philadelphia, I'm now in the Los Angeles area. Uh, we used to have veterans come in all the time. I went to the VA hospital, they turned me away because I'm not an Iraqi Afghanistan veteran. And I said, it doesn't matter. That's not the requirement for VA hospital healthcare. Sometimes you need to utilize the patient advocate and the various social workers at the hospital because sometimes that person that they spoke to first didn't know the full situation, yeah. didn't know all the resources available. They might only know of one or two and are thinking those are the only programs available where there's so many more. SSVF and whatnot covers a lot of things. If you don't mind, I'd like to just provide a couple of additional resources, and I'm sorry for stepping back in after a meeting, okay, but. Okay, so that's how I check with your encouraging and, and sheriffs, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so another, so the VA's got a lot of great fact sheets on all kinds of different programs, whether it be benefits and whatnot, but going in line with everything here with the uh, crisis hotline and everything, they also have a great program called Coaching Into Care. Uh, I love to hand out the pamphlets to veterans, family members, friends, um, because it actually talks you through how to approach a veteran and get them to seek help. And you can potentially use this out, outside of veterans as well. But they also have a phone number that you can call if you're a loved one, a friend, etc. They can go, hey, look, I've got a veteran who needs help. I don't know how to reach them. They can help you work through it. It's called Coaching Into Care. It's 
kind of easy to remember. Just Google it, you'll find the information on the VA's website, but they've got a plethora of information out there like that. Uh, they've also got, they've also got a, a, a thing explaining how to transfer someone to the suicide crisis hotline. So maybe if you're on a phone somewhere or something like that, because I do phone calls all day. I'm not sure if anyone else like uh, out there does it, but maybe you don't have a veteran on the phone call. You can explain to them how to contact the uh, crisis hotline as well, just as the coaching into care helps you convince them to go to care. There's a, a, a fact sheet explaining how to either get a person to the crisis hotline or transfer the call to the hotline. Can you can you say the name again? Coaching in care. Coaching into, into care. care. Into care. Coaching into care. Yeah, I, I, I've never heard of that program. Thank you for, for sharing that. I don't know if it's on VA.gov, but thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Also, for your issue was about housing. Yes, ma'am. If you have housing or emergent resources in your community, you can pick up the telephone and dial two one one. 211 has a, it's a national number that has the resources from your particular state and area. So when I dial 211, I live up in New Hampshire, I can get the resources available to me right there. But if I was visiting someone else in another state, I could pick up and dial 211 and it would have resources there also. Everything from housing to heating oil, if someone runs out of heating oil in the middle of the night, um, everything that you, the resources are endless that they have. Uh, it ain't true. <laughs> the number is true, but not uh, true. So we're good. Okay, so last thing, I'll be quiet. Somebody no, asked my card. I have, I have no, I don't have no business card. I'm sorry. But let me give you my, uh, my email. Adequate and inadequate. Right. Sorry. You don't, you don't have to. <laughs> I'll give you my email. Yes. Yeah, because when I get the email, I can screen those and then give them to my outreach coordinators and she can do some things. Okay? So here's, here's my email. It's very easy. Oh, wow. If you want it. It's Conrad, C L N R A D. Conrad, like the hotel chain, which I'm not related to, which I work on. So it's Conrad.Washington. Conrad.Washington at VA.gov. That's pretty easy, right? Yeah. You email me, tell me when you, how we met, where we met, what you need, and give me a little time because I'm on the road. I'll come back Monday and, uh, and I'll, I'll take care of you. So thank you. Thank you. One last question. Yes, ma'am. It appears that the coaching into care is under VA's website. There you go. Okay. So VA.gov, I told you the one well, stop shop. It's <laughs> actually it's actually www.amazonmaryircc.va.gov. Okay, okay. And I'm curious to know if you can get to that through uh, the big up. I'm sure you can somehow. But thank you all very much. And uh, Mike has it. This was interesting. Well, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to wrap up the uh, seminar. I appreciate your participation. Sorry for the, it wasn't the commander, it was the president of the CNA. He wanted me to come down there and make my presence and talk to everybody. I've been talking to you all this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and all I got out of the deal was out of breath. But anyway, <laughs> the point being is, if you didn't get any of this information, We've already been told that this will be on YouTube tomorrow. Go back and review it, Thank you. and you can pull all that information down. You've got me as a point of contact. I've already given you my number. Please text me and let me know who you are. I, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting all of you with my number. Okay. That's on the website. <laughs> but also, I want, you to, I want to reiterate, the subject matter experts that stood before you today to give you the, the list of programs doesn't make us a subject matter expert. It gives us resources. So as chaplains, I don't expect you to know it all. Mm -hmm. I don't know it all, but I know people who do know it all. And I go to them, and they help me. So don't feel like because you have a chaplain in front of your name that somehow you've got to be the know-all, be-all. It doesn't work that way. You can, you can pull on one another's resources, come together, call me. And if I don't know where to get you, then we'll get someone who can get you where you need to go. And again, uh, I appreciate everything uh, that you guys do for our membership. I want to, uh, to uh, recognize Janet one more time and Conrad uh, Washington. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. We'll see you again next year.